All right, another week of creating a culture of discipleship that leads to worship and compels us to be on mission. If you turn your Bibles to Exodus chapter 7, verse 1. Um, we're in a preaching series, as I was talking about before, called Salvation. What it means to be a saved people. Um, the preaching series is an exposition of a book in the Bible called Exodus, if you've never heard of it. Um, Exodus is the story of how the God who made the earth picked a nation of slaves and set it apart for his name. So much so that in Deuteronomy 32, it says, Happy are you, Israel, who is like you, a people saved by the Lord. What a blessing it is to be a part of a whole people who identify as being saved by God. Amen. This is a central theme of the book of, of Exodus. It's, it's not simply a story of slaves becoming free. It's the story of God redeeming an entire nation to himself. The rest of the Old Testament, the nation of Israel is going to be defined by what happened in this book. God never gets over it. <laughs> he never gets over what he does for them in Exodus. If you ever, someone does something for you and then you kind of say, there'll be no living with him after this. This is kind of that thing. The rest of the Old Testament, God will bring up, I am the Lord who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. The rest of the Old Testament, he will bring this up. When mankind determined to get the blessing of God without God in Genesis 1 or 2, God took man's blessing away and he called their state, he called their their rebellion against him, sin. That so much so that by Genesis 5, it says, the, law, the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Therefore, God called the man Abraham and promised to bless him and his offspring. He would send them into slavery, but he would deliver them and redeem them to himself. What is going to happen in Exodus will determine everything about who the Israelites are as a saved people. The people of God today are the same. Christians are saved from our sin in one wave of sovereign grace from the God who made us and called us by his name and his power. Their whole life after is about it's just it's defined by that saving act. Those who are saved by Jesus from being enslaved to their sin, everything about their lives is defined by this saving work on the part of God. So this series is going to illuminate the many characteristics associated with being a saved people in Egypt and therefore what it means to be a saved people today. So we're going to ta talk today about a very prevalent theme through Exodus and what it has to do with being saved, and that is the matter of God's sovereignty. God's sovereignty. If you haven't, uh, if you're new to this whole uh, church thing, or you're new to being a Christian, you may not know that word. Sovereign means the authority of an individual or state to govern itself or others. So there are sovereign states, right? Um, sovereign nations, right? Um, that means you, are, you have the authority to govern yourself. Arizona is not a sovereign state. We don't just govern ourselves. The whole of the United States, the federal government uh, rules us. However, there are sovereign nations in Arizona, places like uh, the Navajo Nation. The Native American tribes around, the na around, those are actually sovereign countries, not ruled by the federal government. Um, this is talking about God's ability of ruling himself and others. Okay, it's a prevalent theme throughout Exodus. So I'm going to give a whole sermon about it because chapter 7 is going, this is going to be a, what we see in chapter 7 verses 1 through 13 is going to be a very repeated scene throughout the rest of the next five chapters. Okay. The, the plagues, the ten plagues that many of you know, the ten plagues against Egypt, there's five, there's a, uh, there's five chapters surrendered to them. But I don't, I'm not going to have a sermon for every chapter. I have two. Because they repeat a lot, and I think we can get a lot, I think everything we need to know from two sermons. So the first one is on God's sovereignty and the theme of how God rules himself and others. Um, so that's what we're going to do. We're gonna, I'm going to read through these 13 verses, and then I'm going to start walking you through what all, uh, all they mean. The Lord said to Moses, 
See, I have made you like God to Pharaoh, and your brother Aaron shall be your prophet. You shall speak all that I command you, and your brother Aaron shall tell Pharaoh to, tell, to let the people of Israel go out of, his, out of his land. But I will harden Pharaoh's heart. And though I multiply my signs and wonders in the land of Egypt, Pharaoh will not listen to you. Then I will lay my hand on Egypt and bring my hosts, my people, the children of Israel, out of the land of Egypt by great acts of judgment. The Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring out the people of Israel from among them. Moses and Aaron did so. They, they did just as the Lord commanded them. Now, Moses was 80 years old and Aaron was 83 years old when they spoke to Pharaoh. When the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, when Pharaoh says to you, prove yourself by working a miracle, then you shall say to Aaron, take your staff and cast it down before Pharaoh that it may become a serpent. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and did just as the Lord commanded. Aaron cast down his staff before Pharaoh and his servants and it became a serpent. Then Pharaoh summoned the wise men and the sorcerers and they, the magicians of Egypt, also did the same by their secret arts. For each man cast down his staff and they became serpents. But Aaron's staff swallowed up their staffs. Still Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he would not listen to them as the Lord had said. Q ten plagues. Father, I pray that you would speak through me. Um, God, it's very easy to say the right thing the wrong way. And it's very easy to say the wrong thing the right way. And both of them are the wrong things. So God, protect my lips from error. This is a very difficult subject. You write very difficult things. <laughs> and, and it is very difficult for flawed, fallen people to accept your sovereignty. Even those who have been saved by it. God, Teach us your ways. Help us know what you say. Protect me from error. Don't let me say the wrong thing. And if I say the right thing, help us not to miss it. God, may your word fall on rich soil today. And may everyone be encouraged to take their next step toward you. We pray for those who don't know you and are like Pharaoh. God, may you save them. God, may that you restore them to right relationship with you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, this scene uh, is going to be repeated over and over again throughout the next five chapters, okay? God's going to God, uh, commission Moses and Aaron uh, to go talk to Pharaoh. He'll tell them what to say. They'll go. They'll say it to Pharaoh. Pharaoh will rebel. He will say, no way, no how, see ya. And then the sovereign work of God will continue. Uh, it's good. This, this is going to be repeated over and over again. God's going to say, go tell Pharaoh this. They're going to tell Pharaoh that. Pharaoh's going to say, no. And then God will say, okay, bam. And then big sovereign work of God will happen. So we're going to get a lot out of the next five chapters just from making sure we get this one right. Um, he says, you will be as God to Pharaoh. The Hebrew literally says, I have made you God to Pharaoh. Um, Pharaoh viewed himself as God. That's a huge thing to talk about here. Pharaoh viewed himself as God. So to say, you will be as God to Pharaoh is like, I'm going to be what? That dude thinks it's him. Uh, you will be God as God to Pharaoh. Uh, by giving divine authority to Moses, God is confronting the theology of Egypt. And he is doing it through his prophet Moses. You know, uh, we talked about this a little bit last week where he's obviously not saying, yeah, you are, you are a God. He is saying, look, to Pharaoh, it'll be just like you're talking to me. You will be as God to Pharaoh. God has chosen, this is the crazy thing about this, because this is not the only time God is going to use humans to talk to humans about Jesus, about himself, about the things of God. As a matter of fact, it's just going to happen over and over and over again to the point where you're going to go, why on earth do you need these people? They don't even say it right all the time. And they don't even do it all the time. And God commissions us to do it. God has chosen humans to carry out his divine work. Now, some of you might be thinking, oh, of course he does. 
We are super good at it. No, we're not. No, we're not. And he could do it so much better than us. Think of how many times someone hears about the Word of God in the Bible. When do they hear it from an angel? Almost never. <laughs> Angels come to encourage the man of God or the prophet of God to speak the Word of God, but they don't actually just give it to him. In the New Testament, there's so many examples of people hearing the gospel, and it's always done by people. Angels are there. Angels come to Christians all the time. And one time, he comes out to say, hey, you got to go find this Christian so he can tell you about Jesus. And you got to be thinking, Gabe, he's right there. Just fill him in now. I mean, save Peter the trip. That's not how God works. He has invited, he has commissioned and called people to be part of his divine work. At times, the lost world is so lost that we will make people think that they are talking to God himself. Our ambassadorship is so sure that lost people will feel like they address God himself. I mean, but this is a tremendous responsibility, is it not? 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 21. If you look at that, I have it up on the screen if you don't know how to turn to it in your Bible. Um, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. We've heard that verse. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. You hear what he's saying? You were saved. You have brought us into new life. And because of that, you have been reconciled to God. And because of that, you are now tasked with the ministry of reconciliation. What God has done for you, you now do to others, with others, for others. He says, therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. And this next line is almost like he's saying, this is what you're supposed to say, you ambassadors. Oh, I love this line. As as though God is making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. That's your your script. It gives you a script. Isn't that nice? I implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. I beg you, please, be right with God. He has made me right with Him. Please, you be right with Him too. For our sake, He made Him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. We have been tasked with the ministry of reconciliation. This is the earliest form of that, almost. Moses is being told, you go to Pharaoh and you say this, and you will be as God to him just for saying it, just for doing my work, doing the word of God. And uh, so Philip Ryken in his commentary on Exodus has this really neat quote. He says, this is a weighty responsibility. As Christians, we carry Christ into the world. We may be the only genuine Christians that some of our friends and family members know. Their whole understanding of Christianity depends on our testimony. Therefore, we are Christ to them in the same way that Moses was God to Pharaoh. This is why it is so important that we listen to God, that we hear Him, that we know Him. It's not just about you. If you don't know how to be reconciled to God, everyone God has put in front of you will not know either. It's more than about us. The whole world, the the, the plan A for the proclamation of the gospel is people going to people and sharing the gospel. And there is no plan B. You were it. We are part of the ministry of reconciliation. So, point number one about what God's sovereignty means to us I love this task that God has given us, even though it is oftentimes too much to bear. Um, Number one, God's sovereignty means we represent Christ to the world. So that means. Some people will say, well, God's sovereignty means we don't have to share Christ with anyone. That's ridiculous. And they'll say, well, because God is in charge of who is going to believe who is not, we don't have to... For goodness sakes, every time God's sovereignty is talked about in Scripture, it is in the context of taking the gospel to the world. That doesn't make any sense. God's sovereign over his choice to say, you are going to share with this person. Amen. Amen. 
God's sovereignty means we represent Christ to the world. Now, Moses was not God, but he was God to Pharaoh. I mean, remember the first thing Pharaoh says when he brings up, hey, I, the God of the Hebrews has met with us. Yahweh, the Lord, has called us. And Pharaoh says, who? I do not know the Lord. And moreover, I will not let Israel go. And God's saying, you don't know me yet. Not yet you don't. I mean, God said the same thing about Aaron. Just because, I mean, he says, Moses, you're going to be God to him. You're going to be God to Aaron. Because he's going to be, he'll talk through you just like I talk to you. You'll talk to him. You made the same kind of comparison in chapter 4, verse 15. But just like Moses is God to Pharaoh, we know that we carry Christ to the world. Let's continue. Verse 3. But I will harden Pharaoh's heart. And though I multiply my signs and wonders in the land of Egypt, Pharaoh will not listen to you. I will lay hand on Egypt and bring my hosts, my people, the children of Israel. That host means army, kind of a, a military organization. I'm gonna, I will bring you out like an army out of Egypt. Out of land of Egypt by great acts of judgment. The Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring out the people of Israel from among them. You're going to do this, Moses, which is my will. You're going to take my word and be God to Pharaoh. And he will love it. Oh, wait. Let me read that again. But I will harden Pharaoh's heart. And though I do awesome stuff in front of him, he's not going to listen to you. And I'm glad that he told that to Moses again, because the first time he told Moses that, I don't think he was paying attention to that last part. Because last week we talked about salvation and failure, how Moses thought he failed. Oh, it's the roughest part of the Exodus. I mean, if you didn't know what happened after, you're going, man, this is, this is the worst story ever. Um, and Moses, I was the worst story ever. Oh, it didn't work. I win. I told him, and he said, no. Oh, man, I'm terrible. And God's saying, I told you this was going to happen. He's going to say no. Moses thinks, at this point, Pharaoh's response is because of his own weakness, though. The end of chapter 4, or sorry, at the end of chapter 6 ends with Moses saying, I am a man of uncircumcised lips, which is Weird. But he says, I, I, this is all because I, I mean, I'm not any good. It's all because I'm not very good, I'm not a very good speaker. It's all because I should have said the, right, the better words. And God's like, you said exactly what I told you to say. The script was there. You read it. Everything's fine. But he's still thinking it's all about me. But God is assuring him. He's saying, Moses, <laughs> I'm the one hardening Pharaoh's heart. It's not about your mouth. It's not about your success or failure. You just do what I'm telling you. Just, just read it. Just <laughs> say what I tell you to say. And he's not going to listen. Because I will harden his heart. This is going to happen over and over and over again. In chapter 7, uh, verse 22, same chapter here, uh, eventually, when, the, when God turns the Nile into blood, turns the water into blood. Um, it says in chapter 7, verse 22, But the magicians of Egypt did the same by their secret arts, so Pharaoh's heart remained hardened, and he would not listen to them as the Lord had said. And then God put froggies on them. I don't know if you remember that. A bunch of frogs everywhere. Millions of them all over covered the land. Pharaoh begs for relief. Goes, Please stop it. And then in Exodus eight fifteen, But when Pharaoh saw that there was a respite, a respite, a break. He hardened his heart and would not listen to them as the Lord had said. And then God sent gnats all over him. Exodus 8, 19. Then the magician said to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. The magician said that. Gnats came on and they're like, yo, I can't do the gnat thing. I could do the blood. No, not this one. This is not in my book of, of, of curses and stuff. I can't do gnats. I draw the line right there. The magician said to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. But Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he would not listen to them as the Lord had said. Then the story's over. No, it isn't. God sent flies, and Pharaoh bargains with them. He says, well, you can go as long as these guys don't go with you. And then in Exodus 8, 32, but Pharaoh hardened his heart this time also and did not let the people go. God would disease livestock would kill cows and all everybody, all the livestock people owned. And 
Exodus 9, 7, and Pharaoh sent, and behold, not one of the livestock of Israel was dead, because they're the ones that put him away safely for the hail not to kill them. But the heart of Pharaoh was hardened, and he did not let the people go. And then they all got boils. Boils are in the Bible. Exodus 9, 12, but the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, and he did not listen to them as the Lord had spoken to Moses. And then God sent hail on him. Pharaoh begs for relief, promises freedom. And then he says, okay, I will definitely do that. I will, I will give you what you ask. And then Exodus 9, 35, but when Pharaoh saw that the rain and the hail and the thunder had ceased, he sinned yet again and hardened his heart, he and his servants. So the heart of Pharaoh was hardened, and he did not let the people of Israel go, just as the Lord had spoken through Moses. I know I sound like a broken record. Too bad. Locusts then come in. Pharaoh bargains, and he's like, ah, well, maybe some of you can go, maybe not everybody. And then, and then he begs for relief. Just take all the stuff away from me in the Exodus 10, 20. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. He did not let the people of Israel go. And then darkness lights out. Pharaoh bargains again. Okay, take this away, and then I'll, maybe I'll let some of you go, maybe not. And Moses is like, no, everybody's going to go. Everybody going. And then in Exodus 10, 27, but the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart and he would not let them go. And then God smote the firstborn. Finally, Pharaoh and the Egyptians beg Israel to leave. And then in Exodus 14, 8, and the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued the people of Israel while the people of Israel were going out defiantly. What, we're gonna, what we see in chapter 7 is going to go all the way to 14. Over and over and over again. Why is he doing this? Why, I mean, keep, why is he... Why is he bothering doing all this stuff with Moses and him if he's just going to harden Pharaoh's heart anyway? <clears throat> well, what does he say? I'm doing this so that the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. Amen. God doesn't do things for no reason. Amen. He always has a reason. Now, interestingly enough, did you get that? I'm doing this so the Egyptians should know that I am the Lord. Do you, know, you realize the reason he said he was doing it for the Hebrews? Is it a different reason? It is not. He says, I'm going to take you out of the land of Egypt so that you may know that I am the Lord. Curious, don't you think? He does works in front of the rebellious and the works in front of those he is redeeming for the same exact reason. He is doing this so that both Israel and Egypt will know who he is. He said in chapter 6 that he is redeeming and saving Israel so that they may know that he is the Lord. God does those things to get glory for showing them he is the Lord. Both the Egyptians and Israel. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 45, you have this passage. And it's very, it's, I think it's profound. Um, by myself, this is God talking, by myself I have sworn from my mouth has gone out righteousness, a word that shall not return. It means I'm not going to take it back. To me, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear allegiance. And that will be repeated in the New Testament quite often. Only in the Lord it shall be said of me, our righteousness and strength. To him shall come and be ashamed all who were incensed against him. In the Lord, all the offspring of Israel shall be justified and see glory. But you have both people present on that day. And they're all doing the same thing. They are certainly all, every knee is bowed and, and, every, tongue, every, and every tongue is going to swear. We, we are all... We all acknowledge the power of God here. But some are ashamed and incensed for being ashamed and incensed against him, and others being justified and, and, uh, and being glorified, being justified and glorified, and the others are being condemned. But either way, both 
have knees bowed. God's sovereignty, this is in your notes, God's sovereignty means he gets glory from either the judgment or salvation of sinners. Sometimes we like to separate God's wrath and his judgment from his love. You can't do that. God's, God judges in, he still loves in judgment. God saves in love. They are both his love. And if we don't say that God doesn't get glory from judging sinners, we're going to end up preaching a false gospel. We're going to end up saying, yes, there's the heaven and then the hell. Oh, there isn't really one. God was just making that to make you scared. We, we, don't, we don't do that because the judgment of God is righteous. Amen. God's victory over evil and evildoers still gets him glory. He is still glorified by Pharaoh's rejection, just as he is glorified by saving the Hebrews. Exodus 9, 13 through 19. So eventually, if you just, I'll just skip ahead a little bit. Chapter 9 in Exodus, verse 13. Actually, I think we're going to pick it up in 14. I'm sorry. 14. Uh, he says, let my people go. So Pharaoh is, are we going to start in one? Okay, we'll start in one. Is that one, Mary, or is that 14. I can't remember. I'll just pick it up. This is, this is 14? Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, guys. But this is God talking to Pharaoh in chapter 9. Okay? For this time, I will send all my plagues on you yourself and on your servants and on your people so that you may know that there is none like me in all the earth. For by now, I could have put out my hand and struck you and your people with pestilence, and you would have been cut off from the earth. But for this purpose, I have raised you up to show you my power so that my name may be proclaimed in all the earth. You are still exalting yourself against my people and will not let them go. Behold, about this time tomorrow, I will cause very heavy hail to fall, such as never has been seen in Egypt from the day it was founded until now. When we reject God, or whether we reject God or accept him, we're all going to know who God is someday. Amen. We will all one day see the glory of the Lord. Amen. Some of us, through, received, through receiving Jesus as our Savior and confessing our sins, and then others will reject Jesus, fail to obey the gospel, and be face to face with God's glory through judgment. Either way, though, God is glorified. They said they did this at age 80 and 83. You notice that? Uh, usually the Bible will tell, someone, tell you someone's age right before they're about to do something pretty big. Um, but Moses is 80 years old. I, I would think just for being 80 at that time, think of it. Because of the circumstances in which Moses was born, do you realize how many 80-year-old men there would be at that time? Probably not many. Maybe none. He could be the only 80-year-old in, in all the nation. Just from saying he's 80 years old, they're like, wait, somebody's 80. What year is it? Nobody should be 80 this year. <laughs> um, because of what happened back then. His age is special. Um, but he is, and ironically, and this, we're going to cover this in tonight's uh, workshop. We have, a, we have a prayer workshop tonight that we're going to go through. Um, but we're going to read Psalm 90. It's by Moses. And Moses writes in Psalm 90, <laughs> he says, A man's days are 70, or if by way of strength, Maybe 80. <laughs> he was over 80 when he wrote that. <laughs> and he's like, guys, a man's life is basically over by 80. I should know. I mean, he's basically saying, uh, by, if, you're, if you're really strong, maybe 80. Um, but that's the same psalm in which Moses says, teach us to number our days. Same psalm. So we're going we're gonna to pray. We're going to pray tonight. One of, our, one of our prayers is going to be about God, teach us to number our days. Um, anyway, verse 8 <clears throat> As we keep going, then the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, when Pharaoh says to you, prove yourselves by working a miracle, then you shall say to Aaron, take your staff and cast it down before Pharaoh, that it may become a serpent. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and did just as the Lord commanded. Aaron cast down his staff before Pharaoh and his servants, and it became a serpent. Then Pharaoh summoned the wise men and the sorcerers, and they, the magicians of Egypt, also. But Aaron's staff was swallowed up, swallowed up their staffs. 
Still Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he would not listen to them, as the Lord had said. Uh, the role of the serpent in Egypt is one of deity. Um, Pharaoh had a serpent on his head, on his uh, headdress. I mean, he he would have a serpent on his head to signify his godhead. Um, it was a symbol of divine authority. Um, so, but it does say that the these these um, magicians, these sorcerers, wise men were able to replicate. Uh, Aaron's staff being a serpent. And there will be times up to a certain point when they will do so. They will replicate, they can replicate the, the uh, plagues of God, but, they, but after a point they can't even do that. But they can't stop them. Actually, it's really ironic. I would think by the, by the time like the third or fourth plague happens, I'm super mad at these guys. Can you imagine <clears throat> after like not drinking any water for like days and and like the whole Nile is full of blood, and these guys walk up to you, and you're like, hey, Pharaoh, great news, great news. Watch this. And like take your like the one cup of water you had for like the whole day, be like, boom. We can do it too. Now your cup is blood. I, if I'm Pharaoh, I'm going, oh, wonderful, great. That's one thing I needed today is more blood. Thanks, guys. Thanks. And there are many times when this, when their ability to replicate God's plagues have have absolutely no blessing to anyone at all. They just make them look like idiots. <laughs> but they are able to make the serpents, and the, and the serpent of God devours them. <clears throat> that would have been a huge sign of divine authority to Egyptians. They would have reared back and go, oh my. That's why it says Pharaoh's heart was hardened, because what was done in front of him was an act of God that every Egyptian would know. Now, who are these guys? Well, it just says they did this by secret arts. But that, that word in Hebrew means demonic. It, kind of, it always refers to demonic spells, incantations. Are these guys, are they just clever illusionists? Or are they actually doing these things? Well, I would argue, yes, they are likely doing these exact things. Um, and they could have been illusionists, but they, need, they don't have to be. 2 Thessalonians 2.9 says Satan has the power to do false signs and, miracles, and wonders. He does have that power. However, just understand, all they're ever able to do is duplicate what God does. They can't create their own, and they can't fix what God has done. They can't take it back. <clears throat> so their power, yeah, they have power, but it's very finite. The sorcerers, they knew spells. They knew showmanship. They had a fancy show. They might have even had a prepared show of serpents, which is probably why they did it. But all Aaron did was put his staff down. He didn't know enough about God to do anything else. There's no show like, I am going. There was no show. He just, here you go. You know, have you ever, when you're new to the faith, you ever been that person where um, I, I've prayed with new Christians all the time. And, and one, I remember some people will go, okay, here it goes. And, the, you know, before they start praying and they, they don't know any, any better. And they're just, they're, there's the serpent. I don't know anything else, but just do, do that. But the wonders of God aren't, they're not about showmanship. Just, here is God. And I'm going to let you see him throw down. Now, <clears throat> we've got to talk about this, this degree of sovereignty that God is claiming over Pharaoh's heart. Um, this is a very difficult passage. I don't know if you understand this, because when you look at this, you're like, man, God is saying he's going to harden Pharaoh's heart. I mean... What if, I mean, if God didn't do that, would Pharaoh have just said, wow, guys, this is a great God. Let me serve him. Is God really like, does he really do this? Does he really harden people? Amen. Now, let me tell you first why this is actually comforting. Um, Martin Luther has a commentary on Exodus, and in it he writes, only the word of God is entrusted to Moses not the responsibility of making Pharaoh soft or hard by preaching. I like that thought. Um, understand that the word of God is the responsibility of Christians. Amen. Delivering the word of God. It's not our responsibility of making people soft or hard. And sometimes we get really confused by that when we try to make, you know, we try to have clever um, gimmicks, um, you know, things that will, that are, that are, uh, 
kind of more ethereal. They're more uh, about the outside, um, the look of things, try to make, and we have to be careful with that because it's really not up to us to make people soft or hard. Um, so, and I think it's comforting. We don't have the authority to make people do or not do something. The battle is the Lord's. I think that's comforting. Now, here's how this makes a lot of people uncomfortable. Okay, does, and that's, does God really cause people to not believe? And if he does so, how is that fair? How is Pharaoh guilty even though God's the one who hardens his heart? So let's start from the beginning. And guys, this was really hard. It's hard for anybody to preach about. It's definitely hard for me to preach about. Um, and so I'm just going to stick with what Scripture says, and I'm going to do my best to explain it to you because it's not the only time in Scripture that it talks about this. As a matter of fact, the Bible is its own best commentary, so I'm going to use that. But I'm not going to tell you that what God says here is going to answer every question known to man. Okay? So Romans 9, verse 14. If you go all the way to the New Testament, the uh, Paul has his own little commentary on this whole, this exact thing. Um, and this is what he's saying. He says, he's saying in this passage how God is sovereign over who he chooses. He is the one who calls people to himself. And he says, what shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. He said that, he's quoting from uh, Exodus 33, 19. So then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this purpose I have raised you up. This is exactly what we just read in, in Exodus 9, 14. For this purpose I have raised you up, that I might show my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then, this is Paul commenting on this. So then, he has mercy on whomever he wills. And he hardens whomever he wills. You will say to me then, Paul knows what they're going to say. Um, well, why does he still find fault? For who can resist his will? But who are you, O oh man, to answer back to God? Will what is molded say to its molder, why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand for glory? Even us, whom he has called, not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles. Some of you already, just by reading it, are like, what? God is claiming responsibility even more. He's doubling down on his decision to harden Pharaoh's heart. And, he said, and he, he, Paul even says, well, you're going to say, well, how is that fair? And... And Paul says, well, who are you? You're, the, the vessel can't tell the potter, why have you made me like this? Amen. It's up to the potter to say what his creation is for. Now, you can probably say, well, did, I mean, you can ask, did Pharaoh just, maybe he just deserved the hardening of God. Maybe, maybe I mean, a lot of, well, a lot of preachers will tell you um, Pharaoh was already, you know, he already had a certain amount of hardening and then God hardened him as well. I, and I've even really tried to argue that at some, point, at some point sometimes. It's just, Romans 9 doesn't necessarily really let you do that. Um, it said, God said in chapter 4, if you look at, I mean, what's Pharaoh's track record? I mean, yeah, Pharaoh does some really bad things, but get, just compare the Hebrews to Pharaoh. Compare the Hebrews to the Egyptians. And honestly, there's not a whole lot of difference. The Hebrews have done nothing to this point different than the Egyptians. Um, as a matter of fact, eventually, the Hebrews are going to ask to go back to Egypt, return to slavery. They're going to try to kill Moses. Technically, Pharaoh never did that. 
They're, they are capable of all the sins that Egypt is capable of. Amen. The difference was they lacked the means and the opportunity. The mercy of God is not, doesn't vary based on the degree of sin that we're in. And praise God for that. His mercy doesn't depend on how good or bad you were before. All right? Now, now at the same time, at the same time, we know that God is not the author of unbelief. Uh, James 1, 3 through 4, very important passage, I think. It says, let no one say when he is tempted, I'm being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. God doesn't author unbelief. Well, then how can he, how can he, be respond, how can he harden Pharaoh's heart and not cause him to not believe? Hebrews 12, 1 through 2 tells you what God authors. It says, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. You see that? He says, look to Jesus, the founder, the NASB and the KGV will say the author of our faith. Um, the Christian standard will say the source of our faith. NIV will say the pioneer of our faith, the perfecter of our faith. God is the author of faith. He really is the author of faith. Um, John MacArthur, actually, his, he has a study Bible. Many of you, good Baptists, might have one. Uh, but John MacArthur has a study Bible, has a quote in there that I thought was really helpful. Um, John MacArthur, the study Bible, says this. It's a commentary from Romans 9, what we just read. And he says, this does not mean that God actively created unbelief or some other evil in Pharaoh's heart, but rather that he withdrew all the divine influences that ordinarily acted as a restraint to sin and allowed Pharaoh's wicked heart to pursue its sin unabated. I like that description. Keep that quote up there so people can look at it. Um, but do you see what he is saying? And there are, there are levels of divine influence, and we'll get into that in a second. But this, the levels of divine influence, this is saying that God is sovereign over all of them. Um, and, but he is the one who grants divine influence to people. And by hardening Pharaoh's heart, he took it away and allowed him to pursue his sin unabated. Okay? You might be thinking, well, if God created good, doesn't that mean he created evil? Not any more than, than a living host creates a virus, I would argue. Uh, a virus, if you know, a virus is a disease that grows with, it has to have a living cell in order to exist, in order to survive and multiply. Um, without the living cell, you have no virus. Um, but unless the, vi the living cell is there, living and doing good, you don't have the virus. Evil is dependent on good. So, um, so that leads to that final point. God's sovereignty means people have no capacity in themselves to repent and follow Christ. We don't have capacity in ourselves to repent and follow Christ. It's not in our nature. We will not do that. We will be exactly like Pharaoh without God's mercy restoring us to himself, giving us his spirit, calling us, um, giving us the capacity to say, you know what, I, I think I need to be reconciled to God. What, you, what I don't want you coming away with from this sermon is, man, I, I wonder which one I am. Am I a vessel for this or a vessel of that? That's a, no, if you want to be reconciled by God, you, that's the Holy Spirit. Nobody wants to be reconciled to God outside of God's intervention. We aren't just sinners. We're sinners and don't think there's anything wrong about it. 
any form of repentance in man has God as its source. Let me talk about the, so there, there are levels of this divine influence of God. And, and not all of them lead to salvation. Okay, they're, they're, so for example, there are, you know, there are many people who get over addiction that are not Christians. But they realize, if I don't get through this, I'm going to die. And I don't want to die. Um, there are people who are in prison, and they might decide, I want to live a new life, because I don't want to be in prison anymore. They're not saved. They don't go after God, but they go, I don't want to be here anymore. This is terrible. That, is, that may or may not lead to salvation in Christ, but I think it's still divine influence. Because we can't even, we don't even, we can't even protect ourselves from death. I mean, even, even our, our idea of self-preservation is from God. Um, there was a moment right after the hail that several of Pharaoh's servants, they tried to soften Pharaoh's heart in chapter 10 of Exodus. It says, and Pharaoh's servants said to him, how long shall this man be a snare to us? Let the men go, that they may serve the Lord their God. Do you not yet understand that Egypt is ruined? You see, what we, you see what they're saying? Do you not understand that Egypt is ruined? Once the text implies that there were those among Pharaoh's servants who feared the Lord and hid their livestock from hail in 920. Yet there's very little to suggest any Egyptians accompanied the Hebrews out of Egypt and nothing to suggest they worshipped their God either. There are several times when the Egyptians say, you know what, this is terrible, just let them go. And none of them go with Israel. They don't believe in their God, but they at least acknowledge this God is way better than ours. Let's get him out of here. God didn't put evil in the Egyptians as much as he took away their God-given ability of self-preservation at times. Even non-believers still have some God-given reasons not to sin. They do. The problem is not that God is deciding who is just and who is unjust. Like, you, we already know who is unjust. Everybody. Neither Pharaoh or Moses or the Hebrews are just. The problem is in who God is showing mercy to. He decided to show mercy through his divine influence to the Hebrews, but not to Pharaoh. It would seem we have a case in Exodus for God only heightening Pharaoh's rebellion, but nine implies God's sovereignty over all levels of divine influence. All of it. So we accuse God of being unjust because he is reserving the right to save who he saves, right? So we're saying, like, that's not fair. If you take away the mercy on this person, then, it, then it's not fair that they sin. Have you ever heard of uh, someone having a God complex? Have you ever heard of that? So a God complex in a person... Is that good or bad? bad. It's bad. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I, almost every, yeah. We, we, if someone accuses you of having a God complex, you've done, just done something super arrogant. Um, it means they, ha they have an inflated view of their own power and influence. And the reason it's bad is why? Because they're not God. When we look at God and say, hey, you shouldn't do it that way. We are accusing God of having a God complex. Which doesn't make any sense. Amen. I mean, there, there's, this, there's this, uh, these movies called How to Train Your Dragon. And at one point, uh, Hiccup, the, the prince, becomes king. Because his, spoiler alert, um, you know, his father passes away. And he becomes king. And at one point, he says, guys, we're going to do this. And one of his ridiculous friend says, well, who died and made you king? And they all looked at him like, are you serious right now? And it was, it was a funny scene. But it made, the reason it was dumb was because the kid is king. He gets to say what goes. It doesn't make any sense to say, God, you have too much power. It doesn't make any sense. I also know there is a mystery here. There is a great deal of mystery how does God decide who to have mercy on and who not to? Because he's not doing it on works. How does that mean mankind is still guilty if God could, ever, if God could have pulled us out but didn't? Why does God still call mankind to choose over and over again? He will cause them to choose. Choose this day who you will serve. You make up your mind. You do this. You need to decide if you're going to follow me or not. Why does God bother to reveal his character just as much as to the Egyptians as he does to the Hebrews? Why bother talking to Pharaoh at all? Why not just skip to the plagues? This is a mystery scripture does not attempt to solve for us. Amen. And so I'm not going to attempt to solve it. 
I will just present to you what Scripture is saying, that God is God and there is no other. He is completely sovereign, the boss. And we need him for everything. Now, does that mean that we know everything that God... We don't, have the, we, we don't have the authority to say, oh, well, God has definitely predestined this person to do this or that. Well, who are you? You can't say that. You're, you can't even say that for yourself. I've had people say to me, like, well, I mean, I think I'm predestined to not be saved. And I was like, how do you know? You have no idea what your life is. <laughs> you didn't create you. <laughs> but here's what we do know. Out of this mystery, here's what we do know. And that is those three things we talked about. God's sovereignty means we represent Christ to the world. God's sovereignty means he gets glory from either the judgment or salvation of sinners. God's sovereignty means people have no capacity in themselves to repent and follow Christ. There are mysteries on top of that, but those three truths are so important and they stand. Father, Teach us your ways, God. Help your word settle richly on our hearts. God, we are so grateful that you are God and we're not. God, sometimes it's easy for us to say, well, I would have done it a different way. I would do it, I would do it better. But God, we know that we can do it better. God, your way is better. Your, your way is true. It's pure. God, I pray for everyone in this room, especially those who don't know you. God, would you... Be so present in their lives. God, would you help them have an intimacy with you that gives them the courage to know your will and respond to it. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to invite the praise band up. Um, we're going to go into a time of decision. Um, this is a time where I'm going to, I'll have uh, Pastor Jim up. I'll have Pastor Reginald and his wife Diane up. And we'll just be available for those that need... Um, to respond to the message through decision. It, or if you'd like to, you can fill out a connection card and just say, you know, like, this is what I need to do and I'd like some prayer for it or I would like someone to visit. Um, I, uh, I could use some counsel here. Um, if you're looking at perhaps uh, joining the church or finding out more about it, I encourage you to, to come to our Discover Apollo class, which starts up again January. Um, but don't leave this place without responding to how you need to respond. God is God, and there is no other. And He's the boss. He's the boss over everything. Would you stand and worship and as we sing and ask God to challenge us and, and change us?